Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. Um, this is the last one in our 2020 Vineyard webinar series. So hopefully um, everyone has enjoyed being on these webinars and we can do something like this again next season. So um, this last one will be about what to do from this point, which is Verasion into harvest um, over the next couple of months. It's a very exciting season for all of us, as we know. So I'm glad that we have a chance to kind of regroup before this all starts. Um, today, Amaya Atucha and Christelle Goudeau will both be speaking as well as me. Um, so first up is Amaya. She'll be talking about uh, harvest targets for cold hardy varieties and how to evaluate ripeness. And then I will be talking for a few minutes about uh, bird control options and what the research says about how those compare in effectiveness. And then Christelle will be talking about harvest insects until 1.45 or so. So we'll have 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, just as a reminder, we've covered a number of topics in previous webinars this season. You can see those topics here. The most recent one we did was just last week on sour rot, botrytis, and bunch stem necrosis. So you can find all of these on um, the U of M Extension Small Farms channel. And I know you can also find them on the UW um, fruit channel. Christelle or Amaya, how do they find that info? I guess it would be the UW uh, Fruit Program YouTube or something like that. Okay, great. So um, you can go to either of those places and find the recordings of our previous webinars. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, take it over to Amaya. All right, well, thank you, Annie. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Everybody can see it. All right, so the topic that I wanna to cover today, uh, it's about grape maturity and fruit sampling. So we are um, close to hitting variety here. I would say by the end of this week, probably we will be um, uh, varying with most of our cultivars. So it's the time of the year to start sampling or to start thinking about sampling for fruit quality. And that's what I want to review uh, and show a little bit of data in terms of uh, BRICS TAs and pH that we have collected through, I would say, about eight, nine years for these cultivars. And I know that there's very few information published about these values. And I always get questions asked about, you know, what is, what are the targets? Where should we be? What, what do we, what can we expect to achieve with these uh, cold climate cultivars? So I'll talk a little bit about that. So let me see, here we go. So the first thing uh, I wanna talk about is how to estimate grape maturity. and. I would say the most common way is through these three different assets that would be uh, sugar content, acid content, and pH. Uh, those are the most common. There are many others. Um, in my lab, we do a lot of work looking at other uh, biochemical parameters related with fruit quality, such as color or color compounds like anthocyanins, tannins, proteins, phenolic compounds in general. But these ones are the ones that are most useful to determine when would be the best time to harvest the grapes. So the first one is sugar content. We usually uh, measure that in degrees bricks, which is basically the grams of sugars uh, in 100 grams of juice. Uh, what we determine with this is mostly glucose and fructose. Those are the two main sugars that we find in grapes. And in general, very general range, we expect that by the time of harvest, most of our varieties are between 18 to 24 bricks when we want to harvest. That's sort of like a very general broad range of where you want to be. Then we also have uh, acid content. Acid content, we measure it as titratable acidity. So these are the grams of titratable acids in 100 grams of juice that we measure. And the main, the three main acids that we find on grapes, on berries, are tartaric, malic, and citric acids. So those are the ones that we are measuring. We're measuring the concentrations of these acids through the titratable acidity. And then we also have pH. And so pH is basically the negative log concentration of hydrogen protons in the solution. In this case would be uh, the juice that we're testing. And it's also, we can also refer to it as to the active acidity, which is related to TA, but it's not the same as TA. 
So the pH is correlated with the tertiary acidity, but they're not measuring the same things. And I have a note down there that says that the TA is basically measuring the amount of acids that you have. Well, the pH is measuring the strength of the acid. So you could have same TA and different pH, or same pH and different TA. They tend to uh, behave in the same way. We will see from variation all the way until harvest that the acids will drop, and so will the pH, but they are not the same and they are not measuring the same. The pH is really important because it's related with microbial stability. Uh, so the higher the pH, the more basic the juice that you have, there's more chances of having um, microbial uh, sporulation and you will have, for example, contamination and spoilage of your wine. It has to do with color as well. It affects the color stability of uh, your wines and affects flavor and a lot of other things like protein, precipitation. Uh, it has, you know, the pH affects a lot of other reactions that are happening, uh, especially when you once already start fermenting that juice. In general, for the white cultivars, uh, we have measured that the pH by the time of harvest is between 3 to 3.4. And for the red cultivars, most of them are between 3.2 and 3.7. Anything with over 4 is a little bit worrisome because that's when you have more chances of um, getting some uh, microbial um, higher microbial populations and spoilage of your wine. How do we measure these uh, three indicators of grape maturity? Well, you can see, I don't know if you see my pointer, but the first picture on the upper left hand of the screen shows a digital refractometer. So that's how we measure bricks. And right below that on uh, the left lower corner, there's a manual refractometer. This is very common. A lot of growers have this one where you just put a little drop of the juice uh, in there and you just look uh, against the light, the sun, and what the refractometer is going to show you is the concentration of sugars in bricks just by um, refracting the light that is passing through those sugars. So that's how it works. A lot of you have that. We usually use uh, the, the um, electronic one. It's so much easier. So both of them for PA, sorry, for bricks, concentrations of sugars. And then on the right upper corner, I have the, the picture of uh, one of our titrators that we use in the lab to measure uh, titratable acidity. Uh, we use that, but uh, this is, a, this is a, a piece of equipment that tends to be a little bit expensive. And unless you have a really big vineyard and you're running a lot of samples and, and you, know, you have the capability of purchasing one of these equipment, the other way that you can measure titratable acidity is by using a pH meter. And so that's the image. I have a small little pH meter there on the lower right corner of the screen. That's a portable pH uh, meter. And so you can actually measure TA by using the pH meter. Again, I, I already said that pH is not the same as TA, but you can use it and do some calculations. And, and the way that you would do that, it would be by using um, a base to basically neutralize all the acid in your juice solution. So the juice that you got from those berries, you would use um, sodium hydrox, a solution of a sodium hydrox, and then you would measure your pH, and there's a really easy formula. There's tons of videos on YouTube on how to do this. This is a much um, cheaper way of measuring than having a titrator. Uh, so a pH meter is very useful. What is important is that if you have a pH meter that you have uh, your uh, calibrating solutions and that you take care of calibrating the pH meter every time you use it. The image that I have right in the center of uh, this slide is um, 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 a new type of titrator. It's an acid titrator. Um, uh, sorry, it's an, it's an, uh, it's an acid Refractometer, sorry. This is, a, this is a new technology that with this device, you can measure bricks and TA at the same time. And so uh, this one is specifically for grapes. I, I found it uh, just Googling it. I knew about it because uh, the blueberry industry uses quite a bit. So this is a great uh, new tool. We haven't used it in the lab, but we are purchasing one right now and we're gonna make the comparisons with a regular refractometer and our titrator to see if 
if the values are similar, but then with just one squeeze of your juice, you can get both uh, readings at the same time. So it looks very promising. We'll be testing it. So that is about how to measure sugar content, acid, and pH. Now, some guidance about uh, fruit sampling. So I just want to cover some very general guidance, like if you're going to be and you should be testing your grapes to determine when you're going to harvest. Um, what are the main recommendations? We usually start at variation, but I know that it's very time consuming. And unless you're doing this uh, for research, you might want to start a little bit later. So anytime between two to three weeks after variation, you can start. We advise growers to go and sample for testing for sugars, acids, and uh, pH almost every day that as you get you know, within a week of harvest uh, because things can change pretty fast, especially if the weather is warm. So at the very beginning, you can space those samplings more, but as you're getting closer to harvest, you might want to uh, do those samples more often. Between 100 to 200 berries per block per cultivar is uh, what we recommend. And when I say per block, I refer to the same cultivar uh, maybe, you know, a block that has very uh, similar characteristics, it's very homogeneous, the vines look the same, they're the same age, you know that those vines, you know, sort of behave in the same way, you harvest them at the same time, that would be a block. And so for that, we recommend between 100 to 200 berry samples. Uh, if you are collecting clusters, which is the other thing, I would say about 10 clusters would be uh, you know, similar to 100 to 200 berries. When you're collecting the berries, you want to sample from everywhere in the cluster. So you want to, because the, the berries within the clusters are going to be uh, maturing at different rates, not all the same. So you want to have a good representation. And so from the top of the clusters, the bottom, the back, the shoulders, everywhere, and also from both sides of the trellis, you want to collect berries. So a pretty um, representative sample of those berries that you have uh, across the panel from different vines and also from both sides of the trellis. We recommend to sample at least 10% of the vines in that block. That's, that's, you know, out of all the vines that you have, about 10 of, of those vines, you would go and collect some berries from them. Um, it's important to collect the samples at the same time of the day. If you collect some Sometimes in the morning and sometimes in the afternoon, what happens is that in the afternoon you might have actually higher bricks, so higher sugar than if you collect them in the morning. We usually try to do it in the morning and we stick to that time every single sampling that we do. Uh, so I would recommend that uh, you just you know, pick one and then do it always at the same time. Avoid uh, sampling berries from clusters of vines that are in the edges of the blocks because those vines get more sun and they might be a little bit further along in maturity. So they're not a good representation of the rest of your block. And then the best way to collect the samples is just using a simple bag. You just put your berries in there, you close it. And if you're gonna collect a lot and you're gonna spend you know, several hours collecting berries, I would recommend that you carry with you a cooler and you keep those samples cool until you are able to, um, to analyze them with your refractometer or with your pH, uh, unless you are doing it as you go. Uh, then if you wanna store them, I would say do not store them in a refrigerator, but don't store them more than one day. So the next slide I have. So here is uh, this slide that I prepared looking at kind of like all data that we've collected for some of the cultivars, I would say probably the most uh, popular cultivars of coconut grapes. And so um, what we've done is we've, you know, we've been sampling the same vineyards for, as I said, maybe over, you know, nine, eight years for some cultivars, like the, the older ones, like in Brianna, Marquette, and Frontenac, we have a ton of data, and La Crescent as well. And so what we see in general is um, when we harvest these cultivars here in Madison, so southern Wisconsin, we get, these are the range of values that we've gotten for about 10 years. So Brianna, uh, this white cultivar, Brianna tends to have, you know, bricks not very high between 17 to 20, but the TA is very low. It's probably one of the cultivars that has, that achieves the lowest uh, TA. 
And this sometimes can be a problem because it drops really fast. And when the grapes that you harvest have very low uh, TA, the wine that you make tend to have a little bit more of that Labrusqua um, flavor. And so we're always very cautious Anna, to try to avoid getting too low in our TA because we ended up you know, having you know, wines that are probably not as fresh as we would like or not as fruity and floral as you can get when you have a little bit higher uh, TA and higher concentrations of acid. La Crescent tends to be one that we really struggle with lowering the TA, the opposite between 13 to 15 is where we usually harvest them. I think that that, you know, 13 was probably an outlier a year that uh, I think it was 2012, that was a very warm year and it really dropped. But in general, we have a high, uh, we really have high uh, TA in uh, La Crescent. Itasca relatively new, uh, of the years that we've harvested here, uh, these are the values that we get. Uh, the TA is a little bit more moderate, between 12 to 13, and then the bricks we achieve between 21 to 22. Marquette, I would say, you know, it's, we usually get into the higher range of, of bricks, uh, between 23, 24 is pretty normal, and the TA is a little bit lower than uh, on some of the white varieties, especially like Crescent. Frontenac, tends to get higher bricks around 25. It's very usual that we harvest them between 24 and 25 here in Madison in our research box. But the TA is again, something that we, we truly struggle with with Frontenac. So anything that we can do like leaf removal that would increase the drop of that TA uh, before harvest, we try to implement it every year. And Petit Pearl, very popular this year in Wisconsin. We achieve with Petit Pearl around 20 to 22 bricks most of the years, and the TA is much lower than in Frontenac and Marquette. They are the two red cultivars, and we get between 9 to 11. In terms of pH, you know, it's all of them are kind of close. That's why I say we can see difference in TA, but not necessarily means that the TA changes in the same uh, degree. There are two different things. And so in the case of the pH, anywhere between 3.0 to 3.4 is where we usually uh, get out of those um, grapes when we harvest them or harvest them. And just for comparison, I was brief, briefly looking at the growing degree days that we get here in Madison for, for those of you that are somewhere else. So I have uh, five years that I was looking at for growing degree days accumulation from April 1st to September 30. And we usually get about 2,600. I said one of the years was 2012 that we got the most. It was almost 3,000 growing degree days from, again, April 1st to September 30. Uh, but in general, I would say between 2,600 and 2,700 is where we get here. So that, those are the values that we get. If you have lower growing degree days accumulation, you will probably have um, lower bricks accumulation. And with that, that's everything I have. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing and I think that we're gonna answer, I don't know if we, if Annie wants us to answer questions now or maybe we'll leave all the questions uh, to the end. Um, we're gonna save most of the questions for the end, but the one question that came up during your presentation um, was from Craig. He asked, how much is the COM BP meter? Am I reading that correctly? I don't know if I see it. It's so I was looking at the uh, acid refractometer. I probably used that one. Uh, I was looking at online, and I and I think I thought somewhere between two hundred and fifty and three hundred dollars. Um, but as I say again, I I haven't used it. I know that the blueberry industry uses it quite a bit, uh, and when I check on their website, and they're probably in multiple brands. I didn't I didn't spend a lot of time looking at all the brands, but. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, I would still like to validate it. I haven't used it, but in their website, they had it specifically for grapes. So they're using it at grapes as well. I wonder whether maybe it's something that in California or in Washington, they're using uh, more commonly. But it seems like a great tool if you can get your TA and your bricks at the same time with only, you know, one button. Thanks. Okay. So um, we'll just go into the next presentation. And then if you had more questions, um, if you think of questions later for Amaya, just type them into the chat box because we will get to those um, at the end. 
So uh, I wanted to review some of the bird management options that we have um, because I do get a lot of questions about this this time in the season, even though admittedly it's a little bit late to be selecting your um, bird management methods, especially if you need to order some. Um, but this is a definitely a topic of conversation this time of year. Uh, so I have been spending some time reading the literature to see what studies have been done that actually compare how effective these bird management methods are. And it's really interesting. A lot of the research has been done in California and Australia. There's not a lot of research on bird management methods in the Midwest, which I did find interesting. Um, maybe there's just one or two research labs in California that uh, have this as a focus, I don't know. But I did have to kind of dig far back in the history of viticulture research because some of these studies um, are pretty old, so they date back to the 70s. Uh, I learned a new vocab word, it's called frugivorous. Frugivorous, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And so that just means any animal that feeds on fruit. Um, herbivores can be frugivorous as well. So humans are frugivorous if we eat fruit. All right, so we're talking about frugivorous birds that like to eat grapes. Um, a lot of these birds also like to eat blueberries. So a lot of the, the studies I found were comparing grapes and blueberries and sometimes cherries as well. Anyway, so there are a number of methods available. They do differ in effectiveness. And for some of these, there's not a lot of research showing how effective they are. Um, the main one, of course, is bird netting. Uh, the second one is methyl anthranolate uh, as a foliar spray. And this is basically an artificial flavoring chemical uh, that can be sprayed. It is labeled for application to fruit crops. So it can be sprayed on grapes. And the idea is that it can deter birds, but we'll see if that if it actually works. Uh, artificial sounds such as cannons and gunshots, I know that those are popular in Minnesota. Another one that's popular up here is distress call mimicking sounds. Um, the popular piece of equipment that I see a lot is called bird guard. Another is lasers, and then there's drones, and of course the traditional balloons and kites, which we don't, they don't seem to work very well, um, at least I'm not on my family's vineyard at all. And then uh, the introduction of predatory birds, such as owls, and in other parts of the world, falcons. Keep in mind, there are a lot of different factors that impact bird pressure. And this paper that I cited here from 1972 goes into some of those factors that can affect how many birds we're actually seeing on the vineyard, how much pressure is there from the bird population. So it depends on species, the environment, the time of day, the grape variety, the sugar levels of the grapes, uh, the foliage, uh, that was an interesting one. The amount of foliage in the vineyard can actually affect how, um, how some species of birds get into the grapes and how some don't. Um, surrounding vegetation, like is it surrounded by cornfields, um, swamp, woods, whatever, and then weather. So is it hot? Has it been really dry? If it's been really dry, maybe the birds are going to gravitate towards the vineyard because there's not a lot of other food sources. If it's been wet, maybe they're gonna be elsewhere. So a lot of different factors to consider. Um, this paper was very interesting. It did a comparative study of uh, three different methods. This is from 2007. So they were comparing bird netting, distress calls like bird guard, for instance, or visual deterrence. And they found that with bird netting, uh, the vineyard only experienced 2.3% damage, so that's very low. Um, in other words, that would be like 97.7% effective. Um, when they combined the distress calls with the visual deterrents like balloons and kites, uh, they got 5.7% damage. And then with the visual deterrents alone, without the distress calls, 13% damage to the vineyard. So what that's showing is if you're, if you're going to be using the visual deterrence, it's going to work a lot better if you add the distress calls into that system. Um, but in this study, bird netting still did the best job. One of the reasons for this is not all the birds responded how we want them to respond to the distress calls. Some of the bird species that they were looking at had no effect of the distress calls, and some of them were actually attracted to the distress calls. Robins, for instance, they actually tended to come to the vineyard when they heard those calls rather than scattering. Bird netting is not discriminatory. Bird netting is going to exclude basically any bird in the vineyard regardless of species. So uh, this is a picture of uh, me and my husband using the netter getter. Um, full disclosure, my dad and uncle actually invented the netter getter and uh, my uncle is Paul Claude, the one who manufactures that in Iowa. This is not an advertisement for the netter getter. However, I'm just showing it as an example. 
Um, a lot of vineyards in Minnesota do have net machines, whether it's it's this product or one that they have made themselves. It makes applying net to a vineyard a lot more efficient. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail on netting. I think at this point we all know uh, what netting is and how to use that. Um, but bird distress calls. So one example is bird guard. And there's a lot of questions about whether or not these are going to be as effective as netting. Um, but there's, there have actually been quite a few studies on uh, bird distress calls and how effective they are. And these studies have found that they're going to be effective for about two to six weeks before the birds habituate to them, meaning the birds just start, get, start to get used to them and think, oh, okay, well, I keep hearing these sounds, but then nothing bad happens. So they'll keep going back to the, to the vineyard. Um, so then one of the literature reviews on this said that some of the studies on distress calls found these effective, but about half of them found them ineffective. So there's a lot of variation in how effective this is. Maybe the vineyard down the street from you has very good luck with bird guard, but then if you try it, maybe you don't have the same results as they do. So it, it's just important to realize that this method varies a lot from vineyard to vineyard. Um, it's been found that they have better performance when integrated with other methods, um, such as cannons or uh, such as the visual aids. And they found that robins do not always disperse. Uh, they might actually congregate, like I mentioned before, and they tended to be more effective on starlings. That's from a study from 2007. So in summary, uh, this tactic may or may not work well on your vineyard, and there's probably a lot of different factors at play that are impacting the success of these in all of those different studies. Um, chemical repellents. I had a conversation with somebody about these just the other day. So the active ingredient in these is methyl ethranolate, and uh, an example of a product that contains this is avian control. Um, so there were four studies that I was able to find on this, um, as well as a literature review that basically said, yes, these are the only four studies on this product uh, that they could find. Three of them found it ineffective and one found it to have some effect on certain species, but certainly not overall effective on all bird species that might uh, eat our grapes. And so um, right now I cannot recommend this product because, the, because three of the four studies that I've been able to find found it ineffective. Um, there is one vineyard in Minnesota that uses it and they feel that it is effective on their vineyard. I won't dispute that. Um, just think about, you know, if you try this method and you find it effective, that's great. Um, think about what other factors might be impacting that as well. So here's some things that you could read about um, the effectiveness of uh, those chemical repellents. Another one that's coming up more recently in the research is using drones to scare away birds from the vineyard. Uh, so this study from 2019 was certainly very interesting. So they flew drones, also called unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, over the vineyards and uh, the, they attached um, speakers to them to actually play the distress calls. So the drones are playing the distress, the distress calls and they attached taxidermy crows underneath each UAV. Um, and they found that one drone can effectively cover 61 acres uh, so if a vineyard is larger than that, they're going to need a uh, second drone. Um, they also found that one UAV flight could deter silver eyes, which is one of the species they were studying, for 15 minutes. Um, and so that would mean that if you're using a, a drone, you would need to be out there flying it every 15 minutes. Um, I'm not as up on UAV regulations as I used to be, but I, the last I knew, it, you still need to actually be there watching the drone while it's flying. It can't just be flying on its own. Um, that may have changed, but the last I knew that was the regulation. So you would, you would have to be out there quite a bit. Uh, this study was also done in Australia, so it's not our birds and not our environment. Um, but I do find this to be an interesting field of study. Another one uh, is lasers. And so I would say that in my opinion, this is a promising area and it's very interesting as well. It's not commonly adopted yet and I couldn't find much of any research on it, to be honest. Um, basically what I found online was a couple of anecdotal stories of people saying that it worked for them on their farms, um, not in vineyards, but in uh, blueberry farms. Um, there was one study that had a paywall, so I couldn't access it. So um, I linked one article down here that maybe you can read it and find it interesting. I know that there is one vineyard in Minnesota that used lasers in 2019. And as far as I know, they are planning on using it again in 2020. So I will look forward to hearing um, 
what results they get from that. I know that they had to install a couple of different lasers because of the size of their vineyard. And uh, I just feel that this is, this is a promising area, but there does need to be more adoption of lasers on vineyards before the effectiveness of this technique can really be evaluated. Um, so just keep your eye out on uh, research and stories about lasers on vineyards. Just a few notes, if you're gonna be testing new bird methods on your vineyard, let's say you're sick of using netting and the time it takes to take it on and off, um, it, maybe you wanna try some other things. Just keep in mind, as far as we know, based on the research, netting is still the most consistently effective and reliable method because as I was saying before, this is a physical exclusion. So it's going to exclude uh, basically any birds that are in the vineyard as long as they're not hopping up from the ground into the net. Um, whereas other methods, they're really dependent on the species. Each species reacts differently to these methods. So right now, you know, if, if you really want that complete effectiveness, netting is still the way to go. Um, keep in mind, bird pressure varies uh, each year. So if you try a new method, um, just be cautious not to uh, be too quick to attribute low bird damage to a new method uh, if you don't have an untreated area of the vineyard to compare it to. So let's say if, if you apply avian control, um, that spray product to your whole vineyard, and you don't have a lot of bird damage that year, maybe it's due to that new treatment that you tried, but maybe we just didn't have a lot of bird pressure that year. So um, before you become too attached to a method and too reliant on it, just, just make sure you understand all the different things that could be impacting the success of it. Um, so I would give a new method a couple of years in your vineyard before drawing too many conclusions about its effectiveness. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my take on bird management methods right now. Um, hopefully a couple of those things like maybe the lasers or the drones could be a, a promising uh, method in the future once we get more exposure to it. Well, thank you, Annie. And I guess I'll start with mine. Or do you want your questions now? Um, there aren't any questions. Okay. So let's see. Okay, there we go. Okay, well, all right, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. And I'll be, I'm Christelle Guido. I'm the food crop entomologist at UW Madison. And I'll be talking about the insects that you should be paying attention at harvest. So you might have other insects that I'm not covering here, but here are three that we are um, paying close attention to um, in general at harvest uh, for grapes. So I'll start with the uh, multicolored Asian lady beetle. And I just wanna show you this slide because it shows you the different color patterns that they have. There's really a lot. So trying to recognize them based on their coloration or the number of spots is not gonna be the way to go. If you can see my mouse, mouse moving here, it's this kind of M on the thorax of the ladybug that you can um, help you identify that it is multicolored Asian lady beetle. But that's about it. Um, and as you should know, hopefully, uh, all uh, Asian, all uh, lady beetles are known to be uh, biocontrol agents. So in general, that's why they're here. And multicolored Asian lady beetle was introduced for biological control uh, to begin with. Um, so that's what we usually uh, see them for. But then uh, we also have the problem with this species in particular that wasn't intended, is that they aggregate in, in the fall or early fall, uh, late summer, on those late season fruits. And the reason why is because they really need uh, sugar before they go over winter. And as you know, they overwinter in your houses. So there's been research showing that they need this um, um, uh, sugar solutions um, to um, survive for the winter longer. So we'll find them in grapes, in apples, and raspberries. Where, from a standpoint of grape, um, there's a study. So most of the studies I'll talk about today, I think maybe even all of them are from Minnesota, actually. But this paper by Galvin et al. in 2008, they put intact frontenac grapes. They exposed them to one um, <clears throat> lady beetle for 24 hours, and there was no evidence of damage. And I'll show you a slide about that after. And then another uh, problem with those lady beetles that most of you know is when you're making wine and you're crushing those lady beetles, we have what we call ladybug taint. And I'll talk about that in the following slides too. So um, this was a study 
another one where they looked at, um, oh, so sorry. First of all, uh, the studies have shown pretty much that they don't cause the initial damage, that it's pretty much uh, using the damage that's been caused by birds or other insects, and then those uh, beetles come in and feed on, on those uh, uh, wounded grapes. And then this, this other study that showed that they will settle on damaged grapes way more than they do settle on undamaged grapes. And so you can kind of see that here in the red rectangle, this is undamaged grape. You have way more that do uh, settle on those than on undamaged grapes. So confirming uh, yet again in another way that they go where the damage is already there. So when we talk about that ladybug taint, um, we all know that it's a negative impact on the wine quality and it's caused by the hemolymph. The hemolymph is the blood of insects and it's uh, this compound, uh, 2-isopropyl 3-methoxy pyrazine, that is, is found in the hemolymph of those multicolored Asian lady beetle as a deterrent for predators. And so that's what gives them that, gives the, the wine that taste, that bitter taste. Um, there has been some thresh, thresholds uh, for red wines. It's 1.3 uh, multicolored Asian lady beetle per kilogram of grapes. For whites, 1.5 uh, per kilogram of, of grapes. Um, and what a, a study has found is that almost two lady beetles per kilogram of grapes was detected by 10% of the human population. And that corresponds to about uh, a third of a beetle per Frontenac cluster. So there has been remedies that have been suggested in research. Um, for example, activated charcoal in white wines, uh, deodorized oak in red wines, oak chips in both red and white wines, I don't know if anyone has implemented that, if people have had successes or failures with this. Um, I don't know. Um, it, it's not very clear that it works really well, and I don't know if people are ready to implement those for remedying this uh, taint. So if anybody, even in the panelists, have suggestions on that at the end, we can talk about that. Um, so again, they come where there's uh, clusters that are damaged and when there's sugar for them to get. So, they correlate with the increase in percent cluster with damaged berries, um, and they arrive two to three weeks uh, before harvest. So if you look at this graph, that's the, uh, in black, that's the uh, lady beetles on sticky cards. This is the cluster with damaged berries, and this is the um, lady beetles in clusters. So as you can see, everything is correlated, um, and it, goes, uh, it in increases as the number of clusters with damaged berries increase. So for monitoring them, you have those yellow sticky cards. There's also these pyramid traps that you can see down here. Um, and uh, from the, the sticky cards, there's been a study that um, showed that the yellow is the most uh, attractive for those lady beetles, um, similar to the green. So but because the yellow is a very common one, that's the one that we recommend. Um, so what is suggested uh, by this paper from Galvan et al. in 2007 is that you want to increase the sampling frequency in the last week before harvest. Um, the actual time for sampling during that last week should be based on the PHI of the insecticide you're going to use, because obviously one insecticide with very short PHI is because we are at harvest. Uh, so for example, if you have a three-day PHI insecticide, you want to sample actively five to six days before harvest, to provide, provide you time to implement the control. And the action thresholds that are suggested here are 0.05 to 0.6 uh, multicolored Asian lady beetle per cluster. Um, if you get that, then that's when you should implement um, an insecticide spray. Sanitation is also something that you can do. Uh, you can check the cluster to dislodge them. You should cover your bins where the cluster are held as much as possible because they will go in those, into those bins. Uh, you might float the clusters in buckets of water to dislodge them, or you can vacuum the cluster to remove the beetles. So these are different um, strategies that people have used. Um, there's uh, this survey, so there's a link down there if you want to access it. But in Minnesota, um, what was shown is that the growers that use pre-harvest IPM strategy, whether it was sampling or sampling and a single spray for multicolored Asian lady beetle, in grapes may save at least $200 per acre when compared with growers that rely only on physical or mechanical removal of beetles. So um, something that you should keep in mind and look into this survey if you wanna know more about the different strategies, but that's um, an interesting comparison of the costs. 
I will not talk right now about the insecticides that are available because what I did is at the end, I have a, a table with insecticide that kind of go over the three insects for what I could find. So you'll have that at the end. So I'll talk uh, quickly about managing social wasps in vineyard. Um, if you have social wasps, you probably have paid attention to what they look like. And what you will find is that you have paper wasps, which are the ones that are up here with the dangling legs. Um, and they are uh, polistes, that's the genus of those, um, those wasps. Yellow jackets are the more robust uh, wasps that you see here. That's the Vespula. We have bold-faced hornet, that's Dolico Vespula. And then the true hornets, uh, Vespa, um, that are uh, actually, we don't have a lot of them here. And this one is um, introduced. So the problem with the wasps is that uh, there are uh, reports of uh, losses due to wasps, whether it's in uh, grapes or other fruit crops, uh, that can go up to 100% in grapes uh, in some older reports from 2011. They can uh, vector sour rot in grapes and human diseases like salmonella. So there's been studies showing that they are a vector of those pathogens um, into the grapes. Of course, then there's uh, for pickers and uh, um, uh, people that are uh, visiting, um, touring around the vineyards, um, anaphylaxis threats uh, from the, um, um, what do you call that? Oh, I forgot the term, but you know what I mean? Allergic reaction. And then uh, also they can be very detrimental. Uh, in Wisconsin, we have reports that some years they can be the most detrimental pest in vineyards, but it's very, it varies from year to year. And then the management options are very limited and do not provide adequate control. And those management practices are really all listed here. So number one, there is no labeled pesticide for wasps because technically wasps are beneficial insects. They feed on pest insects. Uh, they are not doing any kind of harm to anything. Only at this time when they come and uh, feed on our grapes can they be a problem and as a nuisance problem. So they're not considered a pest. So there's not any pesticide that will have wasps on the label. And the best option that people will tell you is to locate and remove the nest early in the season. So that's something that's not easy to do because it's not easy to find the, uh, the nests. Uh, you want to minimize the injury from other pests because they can um, come after the grapes are already damaged. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, prompt picking is an important one. Um, removing overripe and damaged fruit. You'll see a lot of wasps that come to drop fruit and damaged fruit on the ground. There are some um, insecticide you can spray, but that's what you would spray on the nests, right? So when I mean there's no labeled pesticide, that would be for grapes. If you're looking at grapes, pesticides, none of them has, have wasps on their label. You can buy those kind of um, um, insecticide that you spray on the nest to kill a wasp nest. And then you can power wash uh, with water. You will knock them down um, anytime you see uh, those kind of nests uh, in, in your, on your houses, on eaves, or, or places like that. And then there's trapping that people have done with um, on and off success and different baits and different traps and things like that. So what I will talk to you about now is the research we've been doing uh, in Wisconsin regarding those wasps and grapes. And so what we started with really was trying to figure out what wasps we have, because as I mentioned, we could have uh, paper wasps or yellow jackets or hornets. So there's, or there's different types that we, we may have. So what we did is we sampled and we looked at what we find in grapes. And I want to bring your attention primarily to um, the different pie charts represent different years. We have 2015 up here, down in the middle of 2017 and 2018 up on the right. And really, you can see that the proportion of those changes from year to year. So there are some that are more predominant, like this Vespula maculifrons, but you have also others that in 2015, this Vespula vidua was very predominant, and we don't see it anymore. So there's a lot of variation, and that goes back to what Annie was saying about the birds, where whatever you implement might not be um, really something that's due to the fact that you implemented a strategy, but just a the natural variation in populations and which ones are more prolific one year from the other. And that's well documented um, that it changes and some are in biannual cycles and, and things like that. But the, the main uh, species that we have uh, is about five species and I'll go back, but this Vespula, 
in SPR Germanica, the German yellow jacket, we have uh, Macaulay Franz, we have uh, Dolico Vespula, that will be our, our uh, bold faced hornet, and uh, we have others that then change a little bit uh, here and there. When we look at all of our wasps together, this is kind of the seasonal phenology we saw in 2015. And as you can imagine, the populations take a little while to build up. Um, at around uh, the raisin is when they start uh, ramping up. And then really, um, they keep going. If we had kept going, which we did in years after, they keep going up and up and up into uh, September and even October. So they become a problem because they overlap with the, the harvest at their almost their peak. So we conducted assays to determine if whether those wasp species, the more predominant ones that we, uh, we saw in Wisconsin grapes, were actually able to damage the grapes or not. Um, because they always thought about um, as uh, insects that come after the damage is already done, like the multicolored Asian lady beetle. But it was a little bit doubtful to me that that was the case. So we did some um, lab bioassays where we put wasps on grapes. We had four cultivars, Somerset, St. Pepin, La Crescent, and Marquette to cover our wines and table grapes in red and white. And we just looked at damage versus intact grapes, not together, separately, to see if there was, um, if there was a, a feeding on damage or intact grapes. And so what we have here, this is the bold-faced hornet. And what you have down here is on the y-axis is the average percent of damaged grapes. And then uh, the first panel is the damaged grapes. The middle panel is the intact grapes. And then uh, the third panel here is seeing if those that were exposed to um, damaged grapes and then exposed after that to intact grapes. And here we're only looking at the damage they do on intact grapes after they have been exposed to the damaged grapes. And that's what we call the learning. And so the gray bars show you no damage. The pinkish bars show you only surface damage. And then the red bars is internal damage, where they really were digging into those, uh, those grapes to feed on them. So here with the bold face hornet, what we see is that um, there is um, significant damage on the damaged grapes. There is no damage at all on those intact grapes in the lab. But these are the ones that we documented that learned. So here they're exposed to damaged grapes, uh, intact grapes after they've been exposed to the damage. And now they are able to damage those grapes. And something like Somerset seems to be, or even Marquette, seems to be particularly vulnerable to that learning where they're able to now damage those grapes that are intact when they were not able to do it uh, in the first place. When we look at Vespula germanica, the German yellow jacket or Vespula maculifrons, uh, I don't present the data for maculifrons because it's similar to germanica. But here in this case, again, they feed extensively and do a lot of internal feeding on the damaged grapes, but they also do feed uh, and do feed um, damage onto the intact grapes to uh, some extent, um, very uh, deep feeding and also on all of the cultivars we tested. And then in this case, we did the learning, but really um, we're not surprised because they can do the in uh, damage the intact grapes. So not so much here um, to get out of this. We also looked at uh, what we call a push-pull strategy. So what we were interested in was looking at repellents and attractants. And I'll go over this quickly, um, but we're trying to repel them from the grapes and attract them in traps. We had different designs here. We had control, they're just repellent, attractant on the perimeter, and then attractant and repellent uh, pulled together. And what we found here is that um, in our monitoring trap traps, um, this is the control here. And so anything that's similar to the control with the B letters would be that there's no effect. And that was the repellent alone. And what we found is that the attractant decreased the number of wasp per traps in those monitoring traps, similar to the push-pull, which means that considering that control and repellent were not significantly different and attractant and attractant plus repellent were not different, that we really have uh, more of a mass trapping effect that happened here where the repellent didn't really have an effect, which was quite surprising to us, um, but interesting to see. Um, down here, it's showing you that we pull a lot of wasps in those traps, um, in those attractant traps in the mass trapping. We also tested the repellent by itself, and what we actually found when we just put repellent in a monitoring trap 
And that repellent, actually, I didn't mention what it is, but it's that methyl and trinolate. It's the same than what's in that um, bird repellent. And what we found is that when we use the repellent, we have a reduction um, that's not significant here when we look at all the wasp species. But when we look at species uh, separately here, what we see is that for the boldface hornet, we had a significant reduction with the repellent, and that's what you have here. So all combined, we don't see a difference, but when we pull out the species, we start seeing differences, just like Annie was saying with the birds, that for some species, boldface hornet, we have an effect of the repellent, but not with the um, other species. Okay, I'll finish quickly, and I'm sorry we're, we're running uh, late on time. But just uh, managing spot wing drosophila and grapes. So I just want to reiterate for the Wisconsin people, because you've seen um, what, what we, the research we've done several years ago. But we tested on our um, cold climate grapes. And you have the cultivars down here, Frontenac, Marshall, Foch, Marquette, La Crescent, St. Croix, and Edelweiss. We looked at uh, whether we have adults in the, um, the vineyard. So we put traps in those different blocks of different cultivars. And we did find uh, spotted wing, I was going to say wasps, everywhere. In all of those cultivars, we do find adults. We also find larvae, but in a very, very, very small amount. So we have very few larvae. There's no difference between the cultivars, but that would be about two, at the most about three larvae per kilogram of grape. So very few larvae. So then we went into the lab and we looked at similar, uh, not all of them, uh, unfortunately, but we looked at similar um, uh, varieties. And here we looked at undamaged, same thing what we did with the wasps, undamaged grapes, damaged grapes, we put spotted wing on them and we compared um, those different cultivars, but looked also with raspberries. And we looked at whether or not we had eggs, larvae and adults. I'm only going to show you the larvae, but it's the same for all of them. What happened with all of those cultivars is that we have spotwing drosophila larvae and adults and eggs um, in damaged grapes, and we have almost none in the undamaged. We had, I think, a total of two flies that emerged, and we think it's because we had a crack in one of those grapes. Um, so really, we have no impact um, on the undamaged cultivars that we have here. There's a study that, um, well, uh, yeah, the study that came out from Minnesota um, with uh, Bill Hutchison and Dominique Benga, um, which you probably have heard her study, but there's a similar kind of trend where most of those cultivars, and they, they tested other cultivars, um, were not seeing a lot of larvae or very few larvae in the field. So there's really a tendency overall that our grapes are not susceptible to spotted wing um, here. So. What I would say is that once the grapes are damaged, it's fair game to those flies. So if you have splitting, cultivars that are prone to splitting or heavy rain and you start having splitting, um, or if you even have a crack at the, at the pedestal, that's an entry wound for those flies to come in. So the recommendation that we have really, uh, from what I showed you, we have flies everywhere. So monitoring for flies is really not the option. Flies are everywhere and we're, we're not even trying, once you have the first fly, there's no need to monitor anymore. The flies are there, there's nothing um, major to do about that. It's sampling for larvae within the fruit. So if you have larvae within your fruit and you're very close to harvest and you have those bricks values that you, you were, um, Amaya was mentioning, you might consider harvesting as fast as you can. So of course you have to, the balancing act, and Amaya and I were talking about that yesterday, of when would you do that? But you have to think about that. If your, uh, your fruit is um, compromised, is splitting, you're gonna have, because those flies are everywhere, you're gonna have larvae in your fruit. So our recommendation is to apply an insecticide only if your fruit is infested, not if you have flies in traps. And that goes back to the webinar we had on July 15th with Megan Hall, about the bunch rod ma management where she was recommending to monitor. So you're gonna have again a balancing act to do here between the adults and the potential for bunch rot um, that happens in the, in the transmission of the, um, the pathogen and just having the larvae in the fruit. So I just want you to think about that because these are our recommendation from a standpoint of 
larval infestation, but it's not what uh, Megan Hall would suggest from a bunch rot management standpoint. So again, a balancing act for you. For This is just to show you what you would do to uh, sample the fruit for larvae. So you put them in water, crush them in a, in a plastic bag, wait an hour and see the larvae that float inside. I just wanted to show you this because it would be four cups of water to a quarter cup salt. So that's something that you can refer to if you're doing this fruit sampling. Uh, we call this the salt test. And then I'll just end with this slide. And this is showing you a subset, of course, of chemistries that you can use. Um, I started off with what we have for multicolored Asian lady beetle. Again, here I'm providing you with insecticides that have um, different mode of actions, but also short pre-harvest intervals, um, at least as short as possible. And then the efficacy for those three different uh, insects that I mentioned. So in orange, you have multicolored Asian lady beetle. For wasps, unfortunately, I don't have a lot because nobody tests on wasps. So there might be a little more studies that are coming out of Michigan now, but I haven't seen anything yet on that. So I didn't find a lot. So when I say no data, that doesn't mean it's not at all there. It's just that I haven't found anything yet. And then you have uh, for spotted wing in, uh, in purple. So I hope this helps in making decisions if you have to deal with those different insects. And I'll end with that. All right, awesome. This is such good information. Um, so we are almost out of time, but we have a few questions and feel free to keep entering your questions. So um, I'll ask this one first for Amaya. When is the best time to send in tissue samples for analysis of nutrients? Uh, there's two times where you can collect uh, tissue analysis for nutrient content. So the first one is at Bloom. And, and we talked about this on previous webinars, I think, and it's also part of, you know, in a lot of the articles that we wrote on the news, our newsletter and our website, is the, you will collect the leaf that is opposite to the first cluster. So the cluster that is uh, closest to the corner or to the base of the shoot. That's a bloom. The second time would be uh, now during variation, and then you wanna take the first fully expanded leaf from the tip, so if you, select one shoot, you count the leaves back, it's about number seven. It was probably the, the, the most recently fully expanded. And that's the leaf that you wanna collect. And you wanna send the petioles. So you collect the blade and the petiole, and then you separate them as close as possible in the union between the petiole and the blade. Uh, and you collect all of that. It's about, we recommend to send between 150 to 200 petioles per sample. Uh, but you can find, you can watch that video that Anna just said, and uh, there's also some information on our website. I can, I can put it on the chat box. And um, you said 150 to 200 petioles per sample, and the U of M tissue lab says like 50 to 80. So I don't know why there's that um, lack of consistency there, but. I think it's mostly about getting a, a, a big sample for representation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the reason why we always recommend to send more. Okay. Um, all right. And then any advice about deterring turkeys? <laughs> Not from me. <laughs> Not from me either. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily either, except that I am working with somebody who's having issues with squirrels in their grapes. And um, the, the best thing that I've been able to recommend to them without short of like installing a fence or an electric fence around the vineyard, which that is an option for you. Um, trying to secure that netting underneath the canopy so that it's harder for um, the grass to get up in there. How about getting a dog? Yeah, getting a dog too <laughs> <laughs> will help. Um, so maybe those are helpful. Um, somebody asked, what does SWD stand for? That stands for spotted wing drosophila. So that's that invasive fruit fly. Um, she also says, I have raccoons and I have an electric fence planned. And I know somebody who has an, actually a few growers who have electric fences and uh, they can be fairly economical. They don't have to be big and fancy. Um, and I, the people I know who have them say that they're using them to deter deer. Uh, so we, the deer might not be able to necessarily see them, but um, they will they will feel that electric fence when they walk up to it. So maybe it would work for turkeys too. 
I also see a question from Craig about how about netting for, netting for insects. And I would say that, yes, netting is always something that you can do. Um, the physical exclusion that Annie mentioned for birds, it's all about the mesh size, right? So depending on what it is that you're trying to exclude, it's the mesh size and it's also the big, big uh, um, part of that is that you want to apply that before you have a population. So especially with insects, um, you don't want to be putting the, your netting in uh, September and expect that you're not going to net with that any spotted wing rosophila, right? So it depends what it is that you're trying to exclude. You have to make sure that there's nothing because if you trap them inside, then they go to town. So that's the, the part that's really important to think about and the mesh size. Um, for spotted wing, for example, it's one millimeter mesh size that you need to apply. For other insects like wasps, obviously would have, it could be a much bigger mesh size. So it depends on the size of your insect. Another question, do you recommend hanging traps for wasps and SWD? So I don't know if the question means hanging traps for, I'm assuming for mass trapping. Is that correct, Teresa? Um, I'll, I'll answer to that and then if it's for monitoring, we can talk about that. But for mass trapping, um, I would say that for wasps, that's what we, we applied for a Department of Ag grant to assess that. Um, because from what we have seen, Okay, yeah, the question is for mass trapping. What we have seen with our push-pull strategy is that the uh, mass trapping actually decreased the population of wasps in our, in our vineyard. For spotted wing, there's been several research projects that looked at mass trapping. Unfortunately, what we have, and it's not for grapes, it was in other crops, in blueberry and raspberries, I think. And the problem we have is we don't have attractants that really are better than the fruit. And so what you tend to do is attract them to the area but you still have damage next to it and you still have, um, you, you have competition between your trap and the fruit. So you still will have um, plenty of damage in your, in your vineyard. Um, I wouldn't recommend it at all in vineyards because like I said, our recommendation really here is that the, the varieties that we have are not affected by spotted wing unless they are damaged already. So our recommendation is to prevent damage as much as possible and, uh, and try to go that route as opposed to, um, to mass trapping. But the research is not conclusive for spotted wing. I think that's our last question, huh? Looks like it. If you have additional questions that come up after we log off in a second, uh, feel free to email any of us with your questions. Um, thanks also to the, uh, the Wisconsin uh, Grape Growers Association for uh, helping get the word out about these webinars and helping us plan them initially, uh, specifically Anna for, for her help with that. Um, I guess this is our last one for the season. So we wish everybody luck with a great harvest this year. Yeah. And thank you, Annie, so much for moderating all those sessions and coordinating and organizing. It's been, it's been a pleasure. So yeah, thank thanks you, everybody for you guys for speaking and your expertise. I think it's been really valuable to combine all this knowledge from two different states. I yeah. agree. Yeah, it's been great. Thank yeah. you for everybody that participated. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.